So the mathematical model of EVM, so it's a mathematical definition, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And the mathematical definition is correct by definition. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's a definition, right? Hey, with a key framework, you get a proof even for the execution of a program. An execution of a program is actually a mathematical proof mm -hmm. that that program outputs what you think it outputs. You can take this mathematical proof and check it. But K is still just a system in the end. It's a huge system. You know how big K is? It is quite big. 500,000 lines of code in four different languages. So there is a huge area of growth for anyone who is entering into runtime. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you for coming in, Grigor. Um, beautiful day, Denver. Now it's sunny, not hot, it's cold. <laughs> But, good day um, for Denver. Yeah, good day for Denver, uh, making from Chicago to here. Uh, we'd love to know more about um, you and runtime verification and the things happening around runtime verification and the industry in general. Um, and first of all, welcome to, to our event today. Um, would you tell us a little bit about you and uh, your story um, in, 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 a, in a way and it's, you know, walk us through the, the, the life of you coming from uh, where you were and how you are now. I'm originally from Romania. Uh, Bucharest? Yeah. And oh, I did, that's uh, a beautiful place. You've been there? Yeah, ah, great heights. Oh, yeah. Cool. yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> yes, uh, so I'm from Romania and I did uh, mathematics in Romania as an undergrad student. And then I came to the United States for a PhD mm -hmm. at the University of California. And in 2000, I finished my PhD. I came to United States in 96. Like in 2000, I finished my PhD. And then I went to NASA as a research scientist. Right. And there, I, as you may expect, I got involved with uh, formal verification of mission critical software. Right, so software that we cannot afford mm -hmm. to let it go wrong. Right. And uh, we looked at all the various approaches back then. I had a colleague, uh, Klaus Havelund, very strong uh, scientist. And together, we tried to find solutions to this very hard problem. How can we make sure that the program is correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, we looked at the standard techniques in formal verification. Um, model checking and deductive verification. These are the two main approaches in formal verification. And at the other extreme, you have testing, right? So you want to test as much as you can of your system. Even now, right, so 20 plus years later, we still want to test as right. much as we can. And only then we move on to formal verification. So, right, so we had this- You test before doing anything in the, the code? That's before you do any formal verification, you mean? Right. So that's that's always better. Test, right? Unit test. As many unit tests as you can. I think that is, it's good to, to... Testing is very cheap, it's fast to do it, so we can catch a lot of bugs with testing before we start doing formal verification. Formal verification is expensive. Yeah. That's the idea. Formal verification is expensive. And actually, that's exactly the problem that we had. Right? So with testing, we could catch bugs, but that was not enough. Right. Right? To make sure the system was correct. And we measured coverage very carefully, right? So we covered all the code with the tests. So NASA has a very high uh, coverage requirement. And uh, to prove systems correct, you need to do more than testing, right? So testing, as Dijkstra, you know, as Edgar Dijkstra said, testing, uh, how is it? Testing proves the existence of bugs, okay? Not um, not their in existence. <laughs> okay, so we can only prove that you have bugs with testing. Um, <clears throat> if you want to prove that you don't have bugs, then you have to do formal verification. And there are two approaches. One is uh, model checking, where you exhaustively analyze all the state space. And uh, it's like testing, but testing exhaustively, right? You go through everything in the program for all possible inputs. And there are all kinds of techniques to do it with concrete inputs, symbolic inputs. But it is systematically go through everything. And then deductive verification is where you use mathematical logic actually to reason about the program. And you prove that the program is, is correct. And both of these formal verification pro uh, approaches had problems. Right? So model checking suffers from the so-called 
state explosion problem. You right. have too many states to cover. Yeah. Right? And you run out of space, time. Too many assumptions. Office. Yes, too many assumptions right, to, to make, too many cases to analyze. Um, on the other hand, deductive verification is very human intensive. You need to sit down and guide it and help it, provide invariance, provide preposed conditions. So both of them had limitations. Um, and we were looking, Klaus and myself, we were looking for an alternative. We wanted to still be able to guarantee that the program is correct, but to pay the price of testing. So testing is cheap. Form of verification is expensive. Yeah. So how can we do this? Right, and that's when we came up with this idea that we called runtime verification back then. Only the two of us, Klaus and I, in an office, and um, and then we just you know, jumping a bit ahead. Then we created a workshop. We realized, hey, this is a great idea actually. Right. Then we created a workshop, and there were already like thirty or forty people. The first iteration of the workshop. Then the second year we made it again, more more people, and now it's an international conference called the Runtime Verification, and lots of people coming. So it became a field in itself. So what is the idea now? Let me go back. So we said, how about this? Let's write specifications with properties that the system must have. Mm -hmm. Same like in formal verification. But instead of formally verifying the system, how about generating monitors from these properties? Observers. Right. And then at runtime, let the system run and observe it. We need to instrument the system to make sure that no errors appear and observe the system. And if anything bad happens, meaning that if the specification is violated at any moment, then have a recovery prepared. Okay, so instead of proving the program correct, you say, just in case it will go wrong, I have this recovery. Okay, and the recovery you want it to be provably correct, usually. But the recovery doesn't have to be as complex as the real system. It's just a simple solution, you know, like a red button, shut down, right. safely. Right? Kind Something of a like kill that. switch. Like a kill switch, like you guys have. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, right. Um, so, but usually it can be something, um, you know, a bit more advanced than, uh, than a kill switch. But the nice thing about it is that you avoid the hard problem of formally verifying the actual code, and instead you only formally verify your monitor and the monitor is usually generated automatically, correct by construction from the specifications, and you only verify your recovery or your safety uh, measure. And suddenly you get the complexity of testing, because it's just run the program, mm -hmm. and uh, the guarantee of formal verification. Because right. you, you, you prove the system correct by proving that you don't let it go wrong. <laughs> the intended behavior is correct. So it's it's running. Right. So I so I have a question now. This is not now we're talking smart contracts, blockchain. Yes. But this is not this is way before this. So what was the first applications or the industry that um, you know applied this kind of technique? Yeah. Uh, runtime. So NASA, uh, obviously, was right. the first. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that, that may not be openly available, but um, the mainstream... Uh, yes, it was not openly available, true. Uh, in 2002, I moved to University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, where I'm a professor of computer yeah. science, even now. Uh, and in 2010, I started a company, Runtime Verification, basically to commercialize this uh, idea and this technology. Um, and, um, yeah, at the university, once we started the company, we continued to collaborate with NASA. So NASA was our first right. client, even in the company. Klaus and I continued to collaborate. Um, and then out of NASA, the second important client was Toyota. Oh, okay. They were interested in monitoring the data verification in cars, because cars have a lot of software and right. lots of things can go wrong in a car. Of course. Yeah. And then uh, Boeing was another client. We did the same uh, with Boeing. Um, then NASA again, then Boeing again, so they were regular customers. Then so Japan, uh, tier one supplier for automotive domain. And in 2017, we started looking into the blockchain space. Right, so these companies actually apply the techniques for safety uh, critical right. systems. Not blockchain, but... Yeah, but safety, the critical safety. systems are yes. actually working as it is intended to work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's basically what we want, um, softwares, 
handling billions of dollars of assets are not getting corrupted by some other things, yes. right? Yes. So. But the problem was simpler, I think, than uh -huh. blockchain. Because in blockchain, the code is public. Everybody sees it. Everybody can attack it. If it has a bug, somebody might or will exploit it. But if you have a bug in a spacecraft, right, the likelihood that somebody will <laughs> exploit it is very low. A couple of 370 asked, 378, oh, what is that? The, the new thing has to go down to, to step in. But here it is, what you're saying is the more adversarial yes. The, yes. The, 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 the environment. Yes. It's good for feedback, but it's also bad for from a security perspective. If it is get exploited, it can immediately cause damages, yes, right? Definitely, yeah. So actually, blockchain was a huge incentive for uh, for formal verification and formal methods. So basically, I think it's revitalizing the domain, the formal verification domain. Suddenly, it became a critical domain for mainstream. Because I think blockchain is or will be soon mainstream. Right. Uh, while the spacecraft, aircraft, it's not mainstream, it's a very niche application, it's super critical but very niche. But blockchain, all the smart contracts now need formal verification. So what do you think the blockchain, so I know the KEVM, you guys formally verified, so that's that's something that the first thing that needs to verify is the, the compilers or the, the, the virtual machines. Yeah. Um, I know you were, you might have done other blockchains. Would you expand a little bit of the space, the ecosystem, mm -hmm. um, and the, the offer, um, the services that Runtime actually verified um, to, to, to us to understand how we are making this space safer, mm -hmm. um, making this critical uh, elements formally verified, right? So it will work. And what are the things that you have seen? Uh, if you can share some of the elements like we have seen this when, when we looked at it, something being verified and we corrected it, it would be eye-opening mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, but before that, yes. before that, let me tell you a bit about the key framework. Great, right? yes. Because that's an important transition from what I did before at NASA and and uh, and what we do now. Yes. Um, so the key framework is a language framework in which you define the semantics of programming languages. Right. So you take a programming language of interest. So before we talk generically right, about programs, but programs need to be written in a programming language. Mm. So what is a programming language? Mm. What is Solidity? What is EVM? Right. You need to understand this question very deeply in order to claim anything about any program in this programming language, which is what you do for my verification. Mm -hmm. So we realize that we need a way to rigorously, mathematically state define what a programming language is. And that's how we created a key framework to do that. And interestingly, once you have such a rigorous definition of a programming language, you have everything you need to generate tools, to derive tools for that programming language. And one of the most important tools is an execution engine. So that's how we defined Ethereum virtual machine in the K framework. And then we generated an interpreter, basically an execution engine for Ethereum, which was very faithful to the actual Ethereum uh, EVM interpreters out there. So we took all the programs on the blockchain, on the Ethereum blockchain, and we executed them, and we tested thoroughly the, uh, the mathematical model. And we were very confident that we have a correct mathematical model. And with this mathematical model, we can now execute smart contracts in this you know, environment, simulated environment, but engineered properly, it is actually fast enough. Okay, so the interpreter that, that, that is being generated from this mathematical model of EVM is comparable in performance to the interpreters that are written by hand for EVM, even faster than many of them. It's faster than Pi EVM, for example. Right, interpreters either in Python or Go, they are slower than, right. than the one that you generate from K. So why is this important? Because when you execute a program with this mathematical model, you actually do runtime verification. You runtime verify the program against the specification of the programming language. The Solidity. Itself, the, oh. soli the EVM. 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 Sorry, the EVM. EVM. Yeah. You can exactly. write in Solidity or in a exactly. Viper or anything like that. Just... And it is very easy at this level to add additional checks. For example, suppose that I don't want division by zero. Right. 
Yeah. EVM is very forgiving. You can three divided by zero is zero in EVM, right? Because they don't want to spend gas to do a check, right? <laughs> um, but suppose that you don't. I mean, you definitely don't want that as a programmer, right? So then you can easily modify the specification to check and catch all these uh, runtime errors, division by zero, overflows, underflows, and so on and so forth. And that's what we do actually. In uh, when we verify smart contracts, we use a slightly modified version of the EVM, and we runtime verify all these properties, and combine it with symbolic execution and symbolic model checking. And we combine all these things that I talked about: a bit of symbolic model checking, a bit of deductive uh, verification, a bit of testing, a bit of monitoring, and all of them automated, right? To give you the maximum. Assurance, no one likes to about so, the program. So you have more flexibility. Yeah, right? go ahead. Um, so, so this sounds like um, in your mathematical model, it's not actually running not on the actual blockchain, but in, in a model. Uh, yes, chain. yes, yes. Um, so, wouldn't this mean that it's closer to testing than actually verifying um, because it only catches the box that you have? based on the, the programs you have given it as input that you have used for testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, so so it depends on what tool you want to generate. If you want to generate just an interpreter, just an execution engine from the semantics, then yes, what you said is correct. You just execute, you exactly like an implementation of EVM at that moment. And as a matter of fact, we put this interpreter into a full node. So we, we, we actually tested this as a full node, we actually, that was a Cardano project. We had mm -hmm. a project uh, funded by Cardano. We had a KEVM node, right? That was uh, able of running normally like any other interpreter, right? But it was completely generated automatically from the specification. This is one of the tools, but the tool that we use for formal verification is a different tool. Okay, we generate a deductive uh, theorem prover, automated theorem prover, which uh, executes the same programs, but symbolically now. Okay, so the inputs are replaced with, uh, with symbolic values. Okay. So when you're doing this, when, when we did this K frameworks, so this is a very powerful framework that you can modify as per what, what you want to. It defines the, the, the parameters that you want to, to verify it, right? It's, 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 you, have, you still have to provide specifications. Yeah. Uh, right, so if you have, for example, an ERC20 token, yeah. right? You have to tell the tool what ERC20, what is the ERC20 specification? If you just give it the bytecode, it doesn't know that you mean an ERC20. And as a matter of fact, there are lots of different variants of ERC20. Of course. We identified about 25. So we have a tool, ERC20, X, no, ERC X, X. Yeah, ERC X that, uh, that takes your bytecode and automatically checks it. But why it can do it automatically? Because it already knows the specification of ERC20. So you write once and you can verify as many times. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's but it turned out that it is not as beautiful as we thought because there are so many different variants of ERC20. So we have like 25 or more, uh, I don't even know exactly how many, uh, different, slightly different uh, ERC20 specifications, right? So when you take a bytecode, we run it and we say, okay, it's ERC20 number <laughs> 14. So all the implementations have, have different semantics. Yeah, sometimes they have like white, list ad white listed addresses, black listed addresses, you know, sometimes they have a fee, you know, for yeah. the transfer, other times they don't, you know, different little things yeah, okay. that, that matter. We also did the, the um, verification of um, Ethereum deposit contract. Well, yeah, the first one was Uniswap. Right? Oh, so yeah. We were the okay. first to formalize the specification of Uniswap and then verify the bytecode using this technique that I mentioned. Right? So we proved Uniswap correct. And actually, we found bugs. We found bugs. I know, I know it sounds a bit pessimistic, but we found bugs in every single smart contract that we formally verified. Not all of them are critical necessarily, but they might become critical in certain conditions. So you don't want to allow them. Catching them early as possible is, is always... Yes, catching them with testing is best, right? So write your best tests. This brings me to Foundry. Um, you guys use Foundry, right? Strongly recommend it, strongly recommend it. Um, Foundry allows you to write specifications, truly. You write tests, unit tests, but they are parametric. They're also called property tests. And they are truly specifications. Um, 
some people think that they are still tests, but specifications are also very similar. Uh, you have uh, some symbolic inputs in what you assume, then you have your code, and then you have some symbolic outputs by like using the same variables in what you expect at the end. And this is exactly what a you know, unit test, parametric unit test is in Foundry. So you, we, we now connected the K framework with the KVM semantics to Foundry, and you can run all these tests that you write in Foundry. You can run them through the mathematical model and prove them correct. So with Foundry, you start with normal tests, concrete tests, mm -hmm. test as much as you can, concrete inputs, and at some moment you can go one level higher and say, hmm, maybe this input can be symbolic instead of, uh, you know, transfer of 20, how about transfer of V, value V, some arbitrary value. Mm -hmm. And assume something about V, then run it, and then at the end, assert. And Foundry has a tool that uh, fuzz generates lots of, generates lots of random uh, instances of these values. Okay. And um, you can, for example, from one test, one parametric test, you can generate like 10,000 different concrete tests. And those have a high chance, they are generated very intelligently, there is a chance, a good chance to catch bugs by just generating random tests. But it's still testing. You do not have an absolute guarantee that it is correct. However, now if you run exactly the same test, you don't have to touch a line of code in your testing or in your code that you test. Mm -hmm. You simply run the same parametric test with KEVM. There is just a button. Instead of running forge, you have another <laughs> button you push, and uh, that will run the test symbolically, and voila, you now prove them correct. Instead of testing thoroughly, fuzzing the property, now you actually formally verify it. So how computationally intensive is this? It is computationally intensive, more computationally intensive than, than, uh, than generating tests, but at some moment there is you know, a threshold. <laughs> so if you want to generate, for example, more than 25,000 tests, mm -hmm. then it may be slower than actually verifying. Right. Verifying the test is pretty much linear in the number of symbolic behaviors in your, uh, in your code. Um, and there are parameters you can use to tune it, say how deep you want to go. Uh, but think of it is slow, but a constant factor compared to the size of your program. Well, if you test, now you pay the cost for as many tests as you generate. Right? So if you generate like a million tests, it will take definitely longer than proving the thing correct. The problem with verification is that sometimes it may not succeed automatically. And I think that could be a problem you are running into. Uh, right now, and then you need to help it. You need a bit of expertise, right? How to, you may need to add an, another assumption. You need to split the property in two sub-properties, prove them separately. Um, there is, requires a bit of engineering, but all these are good to have because they force you to think about your code that you test and you find issues. So, having said that, we are currently in a time that everything need to be, can be proven and can be shrinked into a proof using ZK, mm. but you know, but the ZK proofs are very, th th that's a very different field in terms of you cannot, you can have not much subjectivity into, mm. into ZK, the boundaries are very well defined, right? That created proofs, but what I'm interested in listening to you is like K framework brings this kind of more expressiveness, like everything that he can write and he can create this proof. And he said, the EVM has been well defined. Mm -hmm. Everything in the EVM. Yeah. And he has this kind of runtime monitoring mm -hmm. and everything, right? Isn't it, is it possible to create a proof of the EVM elements of the K and just give us a certain proof somewhere? You mean to, to, to prove the semantics of yeah. EVM? Correct, the mathematical model correct. Yeah, then you don't need blockchains. Uh, and you don't need to pay a lot of gas, but you get this kind of EVM equivalence mm -hmm. of um, an operations. Mm -hmm. so, so the mathematical model of EVM, so it's a mathematical definition, yeah, yeah. right? And the mathematical definition is correct by definition. Right. <laughs> it's a definition, right? Um, so we can see, uh, unless we find bugs, 
while testing, while running programs and getting mm -hmm. weird results and then looking into the mathematical definitions, hey, there's a problem, which didn't happen for a long time. It happened initially, but now it's been pretty stable lately. So unless that happens, the mathematical definition is stable, right? But what can be done, and actually we do that, is the following. When we execute a program with EVM semantics, remember this monitoring thing, right? We monitor and basically, we implicitly monitor the execution against the mathematical model mm -hmm. of the EVM language, right? So basically we can see at every single step how the mathematical definition of the language is applied, which is the same as a mathematical proof in mathematics. In mathematics, when you prove a result, they say prove a theorem, there is a certain number of steps that you go through. Sometimes you have lemmas that you need to prove to help the main theorem, sublemmas, sub 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 lemmas. Uh, but in the end, you put all these rigorous artifacts together and get the proof of the theorem that you want. Hey, with a key framework, you get a proof even for the execution of a program. An execution of a program is actually a mathematical proof mm -hmm. that that program outputs what you think it outputs. For example, if you have a program that outputs 42, on input 17, f of 17 is 42, right. you run it, you can run it with get, you can run it with various you know, interpreters, right, of EVM, you get 42 in all of them, you think, okay, maybe that's correct, but when you run it with KEVM, you also get 42, but KEVM can also split all the steps, like a, like a very detailed log, you can think of it, right, all the steps that together give you a mathematical proof that yes, f of 17 is 42, according to this mathematical theory, of the EVM language that tells us what EVM is. Right. Okay. And now we can go to, I think, what you had in mind. We can take this mathematical proof and check it. Okay. Because because what if this mathematical proof is wrong? Right. So so when you execute a program, I said K generates this proof. Yeah, there is a proof, but K is still just a system in the end. It's a huge system. You know how big K is? It is quite big. Five hundred thousand lines of code in four different languages. It's a huge monster, right? Definitely has bugs. But, I know that sounds weird. We don't care that it has bugs. Why? Because <laughs> we generate these proof objects, we call them proof objects, and now we have the capability to check these proofs. Okay, so we cannot prove K correct, but what we can do, we can take each use of it mm. and check it, right? So once it generates a proof of something, but once it claims that this is a proof of a claim, now we can take that and check it. So it's, mm -hmm. Is that done in K, the checking itself? No, so? it's done with a separate program. We we'll right. call it a proof checker, but it's not the same as proof checkers for uh, cryptographic uh, ZK protocols. It's right. a mathematical, logical proof checker. It's essentially about just a type checker, right? It's, we can think of it as a type checker, but there are no types. Uh, it's really a proof checker. Okay. It checks uh, a sequence of mathematical states, like modus ponens is a, is a classic proof rule. Yeah, right? If you prove okay. alpha, if you prove alpha implies beta, now you can conclude beta. So it proves first order theorems, I suppose. First order, it's first order, it's more than first order, it's matching logic, it's the logic underlying this. Right. That's my next question. This is, <laughs> this is the beast that... Okay, uh, we can go with it. Yeah, yeah this is like, this is... I, I, I was like, ever since that, you know, heard about this the matching logic and reading and then there's some videos and it's like, okay, this is so small, but this, you can do many things with this. Like, this yeah, is yeah. its own... Uh, it, is, it, is, it is very, very hard to do small things that are expressive enough, right? It's very easy to do big things, to keep adding patching, uh, adding new constructs to your logic, new proof rules. Um, and actually, unfortunately, many logics in current use, and I don't mention them, I don't want to mention them, <laughs> because I want to stay friends with my friends. <laughs> so many, many of these actually have been patched. Right? People say, oh, I'd like to also prove this. Hmm, let's add a new proof rule so I can prove that, because I really like it. And then they reasoned about the proof rule. Yeah, the proof rule makes sense. It's not that it's wrong, but it's, it keeps growing, right. Right, the proof system. I wanted a very, very small logic. Why want small things? Small things are easy to, because you have to trust it. This becomes a trust base. Mm. Remember I told you that K may have bugs. I don't right. want to trust K. I want something else to trust and I can to use to check what K does. Okay. Okay. So that's why I need a very small logic that I can quickly implement a proof checker for it. Let's say even in the morning, right? You wake up in the morning, you say, hmm, 
you have your coffee and then say, I want to implement a proof checker for this logic. Right? And then by noon, you're done. Right? So that's, that's the ideal logic. That's how simple it should be. Okay? And um, guys searched 30 years for this logic. <laughs> and I think we got it. Right? It's matching logic. It's, um, it's more expressive than first order logic. It's a bit less expressive that's than second order logic, okay. but it is powerful enough to express uh, any induction, recursion, uh, cycles, uh, you know, co-recursion, co-induction. So almost everything you can do with a computer can be expressed, or almost any proof that you can do, you know, on paper can be expressed also in this logic. Right? So it's, it, it's not as powerful as it could be, but it is powerful enough to serve everything we need in the world of programming languages and computation. Would you say there's an abstraction method? So the logic now has this proof checker. The logic being simple, mm -hmm. there is always a catch. Right? Right. So it's being simple. The drawback of that is that proofs become huge now mm -hmm. because you have to put all the evidence in the proof. Right? So the logic, the simple-minded, dumb logic can check, or proof checker can check everything without thinking just mechanically checking. Actually, I told you modus ponens, alpha, alpha implies beta, mm -hmm. beta, you know what the check there is. I take this alpha as a string, I right. don't even parse it. I take beta as a string, I don't even parse it. I concatenate them and the arrow in between, and I get a new string. This yes. should be identical to the string. If it's not identical, there's a space yes. there, reject. Yes. Right? So that's your problem when you generate the proof to make sure that you generate all the details that the proof checker uh, requires. And now, you can take an arbitrary complex task, for example, to formally verify uh, the gateway, right? all the <laughs> full formal verification. It's a very complex task, right? Now you have the proof. Indeed, it's, it's a proof, a mathematical proof. And you may rightfully come and say, why should I trust this proof? Okay. You guys are nice, the right verification, we like you, but <laughs> why should I trust you right? exactly. with, this, with, with this proof? And yeah. with all my clients and with my future as a company. And we tell you, Great, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. What you can do, you can take this verification, um, formal verification that we've done for you, and generate this mathematical proof. And we can give that to you. Instead of giving you a PDF, we also give you a PDF, yeah. right? Because that's yeah. what security auditors do, and want to show that to your clients and so on. We know that. But we can give you more than that. We can give you an actual mathematical proof with the proof object, right? That you can check independently with this proof checker. And you don't have to trust us, you don't have to trust K. All you have to trust is that the specification expresses the right thing. And this is something where we strongly encourage people to spend more time on. Spend a lot of time on your specifications. Try to understand what your system is supposed to do. Come up with your invariants. So it's a verifiable proofs, in a way. Yes, right. Yeah, verifiable proof. Yeah, that's 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 very yeah, yeah. that's a very uh, good thing to hear. I think it's very comfort comforting that we actually get a proof of object out there. We can actually yeah. check ourselves um, because yeah. this, it would be a concern if if it if it, like a big system like K, it could say something uh, was uh, succeeding even though it was actually a, a faulty program. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes it, it may happen, it may happen. You know that there is a very famous uh, program verification framework. It's Coq, C-O-Q. Do yeah. you know this? He's a big time. <laughs> you know, you know, Andre is a big time on Coq. <laughs> Excellent. And you know, you know that somebody proved false with an empty theory. Uh, it have, it's a, it's a, has happened, yeah. yeah. It happened once, right? And then... Uh, Empty theory means that I have no axiom, right? I, I, yeah. I didn't interfere at all. I just use the basic verification machine. I start from empty and I derive false. Oops, that's bad news because once you derive false, you can prove everything. Mm -hmm. False implies everything. Okay? I can prove three equals seven now okay. <laughs> because I prove false and then I use both exponents <laughs> and I get uh, three equals seven, right? Good. Um, and then they fixed the problem, they found the problem, there was something with, you know, lengths of, uh, of strings, they should be less than, I don't know, a certain length, memory and so on. They fixed that, and then they proved again, somebody proved again, false. <laughs> <That's another laughs> right? But, but what, what is, and I'm convinced that K also has bugs. Okay, I love K, I created K, I love it, it's my baby, but I know it has bugs. 
but you can always recheck. You can verify that. But if I can, if I can use K generate a mathematical proof, and then I give you that proof and you check it, you don't care. Yes. Say like like mathematicians when they write uh, papers in journals, right? They write a paper. It's very hard to search for the proof, but once you have it, and once you write it down, your colleagues can take it, check it, and say, yeah, this result holds. So we were talking for some time, and then I'm asking, like, can we do this and can we do that? Of course, you have seen more and more about the teams applying new ideas. Of course, they came to you. What is your thought? Like, what, what, what are we going to 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 be doing in, with the blockchains? The okay, cave. What, what's the future that you see? The future. Oh, <laughs> so. Of course, I know yeah, you, you have a lot of ideas. Yeah, you, like you never know exactly what the future is, but uh, um, I think I think first of all, people should not write programs; they should write specifications, mm -hmm. executable specifications. Um, so we need uh, higher level, better programming languages in that spirit. Then also, I think that uh, nodes on the blockchain should not execute programs, they should only check uh, certificates, like we do zero knowledge, we'll get to that as well. I, I know that I owe you an answer to the zero knowledge part. So all programs should be written only once, uh, should be executed only once locally, right? And then uh, the result should be committed with uh, cryptographic proof certificates and the validators will just check that. There shouldn't be any duplication of execution. Right, that's silly. Why do we why do we have to re-execute programs? You know, only because I, we don't trust each other, right? But if we generate these mathematical proofs, that the ultimate ultimate evidence that something has been done correctly. Um, also, I think we should be able to write smart contracts programs in any programming language. I love specification languages, but at the same time, people are used to other languages. So why not write? Let people write, you know, any language. On that point, it's uh, like at some point that we had this kind of Eve Austin, like SolarD was going to Eve Austin, but it's like it was, we had a tooling for Austin for one or two years, but the moment that you execute something, you just throw up garbage, of course, right? So, mm -hmm. so would it be possible, like when you say you can write in any other languages, would it be possible that the, the grade of those languages could also be improved? with some kind of verification process or getting the compilers done correctly. Um, I just put the washer because that was there. And yes. it's easy to use and you say like in all the toolings that it's a good 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 argument for it to go for it. But it just just woman a lot of lines of course like for no yes. reason. Yeah, yeah. Right, but on the other hand if you execute it locally, you can compress mm. all that complexity. Right. Right. You just get the final result. And the certificate, yes, the final result is correct. Then you only need and that then, certificate. And then you pass the result around. And it doesn't matter how you got the result. You maybe got the result using C or Watson or uh, EVM, or it doesn't matter. Right. right. You got the result, now you commit the result, and uh, and it's uh, proved that according to the semantics of the programming language. How long do you think this will come into play? Hopefully not too long, actually. So we're adding this capability to K. Here's another thing. If what I believe will happen, mm -hmm. then we don't even need to implement programming languages anymore. <laughs> you know, <it> <laughs> weird. This all is interesting. Need, all, you need, all you need is to define for many programming languages. Like we define EVM, for example, in K. You can think of it as an implementation of EVM, but it's really a mathematical definition. And the drawback of doing that Somebody who is interested in high performance computing will say, well, yeah, but it's not as fast as it can be. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine, yes, for now. That always happened. Yeah. Right? So uh, people used to write code like 50 years ago in assembly, right? Then this crazy high level complex language C appeared. <laughs> <That's the incumbent laughs> and, everybody, and everybody said, oh, this language is never going to be as, as efficient. My programs will be as slow like snails. Uh, no, no, I'm not going to write in this language. I'm still assembly, right? Who writes 
programs in assembly anymore, right? Because compilers are so good now, it's very hard to beat them. You have to be a super master in assembly to write programs faster than what GCC ge generates from C. Point, right? <laughs> also, it's just not feasible because unrolling loops and stuff like this. There you go. Well, but compilers take advantage of architectures, you know, speculation, layers of cache, uh, virtual pages, memory, and so on, right? You, keep, you get crazy if you try to do all that manually. I think the same will happen with uh, with programming languages and compilers and uh, frameworks like K, for example. Right? So K already generates interpreters, which are faster than maybe I shouldn't say naive, but you know, a quickly written, <laughs> hastily written interpreter. Right? So if you just take a programming language, say OCaml, right, or, or Haskell, and you write quickly an interpreter for your language in Haskell, there is a very good chance that the Interpreter that K will generate will be faster than that one. Right? You have to be very good at writing interpreters now to beat an interpreter generated automatically by K. And now to get back to the question why I think we don't need to, to implement languages, not necessarily because K, I don't want to make that claim that K will be faster than the best interpreters anybody can write, because you know, in theory that cannot happen. You can always write manually something faster, specific to a particular language, right? But you don't need it, because if I execute a program with K, let's say 10 times slower than the best possible implementation possible, right? I execute it locally, and I generate this mathematical proof. Okay, and now we should go to the ZK part now, and okay, so suppose that I can compress this mathematical proof. Okay. You know, in a cryptographic certificate, proof right. certificate. For that proof? For that particular proof. Right. Now I give you, the result of the program that I executed locally plus that certificate. And you don't need to re-execute it. You see, and I never implemented the language to generate this certificate. I still didn't tell you how to generate the certificate. That's something we can and we should also discuss. But suppose that we have a mechanism that takes mathematical proof and generates from it a cryptographic proof. Maybe we should discuss it now actually. So that proof checker that, right. that will check the that will take the big proof, mathematical proof. That can and should be snarked. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that will actually generate cryptographic proof, basically snark, that this mathematical proof. This exists. could be big. This could be, this big. be huge. It's yeah. huge. Yeah. But but you'll get a cryptographic proof for the property that a proof, a mathematical proof exists that proves the claim that has been made. In particular, if I execute a program and I get this execution log, which is a mathematical proof, the proof checker will check that and give you a succinct certificate saying that, yeah, we can, we like to call that a proof of proof. Right. It's a cryptographic proof of a mathematical proof, which certifies the claim. It's kind of a recursive made. proof, so creating a, a large mathematical proofs, then you have proof, then you have a succinct proof. Of, 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 that, of that, of that, yeah. Yeah, if, if I wanted to check that this certificate was correct, would I then receive the mathematical proof object or would I run the program and get the proof object? Or, or would be the procedure? So if you want to run the program, you can run it, right? But if I run it already and I generate this mathematical proof, which is huge, and then I generate the cryptographic certificate, that may take some time, some resources. And once I give you that, you don't really need to rerun the program. Because that's what happens now. Now we rerun the program in all the nodes, all the validators to confirm the result. Uh, so the validators, they would check the proof to confirm the result? Or, or they, will, they will check the cryptographic proof. The, the, the cryptographic proof, yes, yes. So that's why I'm saying that. I think in my mind, the future blockchains will not even have VMs. So would, would the proof be stored on the chain? Or is it just... This is another interesting aspect. That's another problem, I think, with the current blockchains. Right. All these security audits, all these um, claims of correctness of protocols, like why is a token an ERC20? Multi ERC20, somewhere. Multi chain ERC20. Multi chain ERC20, right. So, so if somebody claims that, hey, this, is, uh, this code is an ERC20, okay, and um, grant verification audited it, right, what does that really mean? It means that grant verification spent some time uh, and gave you a PDF file, and that PDF file, explains why runtime verification thinks 
the protocol is correct. Our engagement is different because we actually go deep with runtime. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. No, it's no, not no. just a PDF. But I'm, but I'm trying to get to, I'm trying to, get to the real value proposition. Yeah, I know, right? I, know. I think okay. I think will 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 uh, and should you know, right. change the way we think of blockchains. I think this evidence that something is correct should also be on the blockchain, and not a PDF file, but the cryptographic proof. Yes, that certifies that this is an ERC twenty token. Okay. It's, it's very connecting, the reason I say that when, I think it's uh, Celo, they want to do this light client for the mobile because you mm -hmm. cannot just basically give a node for running payments in, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, I think in South America. We, act, I think they use the BW6 curve or something. They can, they can actually make, use a curve to, to make another curve inside and then prove it. And they made this kind of, um, uh, it wasn't perfect anyway. I mean, it's like it's like two years ago, mm -hmm. but the approach is almost same that you create a proof of an EVM and, and a certain EVM execution, so you can actually make the payments faster mm -hmm. rather than in you know, calling a blockchain mm -hmm. with a proof that yeah, you, can, yeah. you can do it. So, so it's, the blockchain it's like can a, be very light. Yeah. You only need you only need the consensus layer. That's it. No, in, in the blockchain, you don't need the computational layer anymore. Also, it connects when you said about the proof, the proof that you can get the SNARKs. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me how the Chia network, they create this kind of massive proof mm -hmm. and they store it somewhere. Mm -hmm. So normally, like, you know, rather than the Bitcoin, create this all the hashes mm -hmm. and every time, every block that you need to get the new hash, right? Mm -hmm. That's an intensive amount of energy that we're wasting. Mm -hmm. So what they created is like, create a huge hash, a proof of work. Mm -hmm. Create it mm -hmm. and then to create it like it for some time mm -hmm. and then make a proof and store it somewhere mm -hmm. And then you create this kind of very succinct proofs that will actually collect mm -hmm. So you cannot fake it. Yeah, yeah. Now what they got is like, you know, 150,000 Raspberry Pis mm -hmm. as a node mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the node itself is very small because they are not doing this proof of work But they're doing a, a light proof of work very extremely lightweight proof of work checking a, a very heavy proof of work that has done before, mm -hmm. so you get like kind of a, a derived security of, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's an abstract thinking, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's it's already there. But I can already start connecting it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's not the same approach what you're saying, but it's like the proof is there once you execute it in a, in a very systemic way. Mm -hmm. It's there the the mathematical proofs and the proofs. Then all you need is like the 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 the, the softwares that you're trying to get this is only getting this uh, we. For the ZK is a very large field, and you know zero knowledge in the snarks are very succinct, so you can actually get faster. Yeah, but this is very interesting. But I don't know. Very fast. Yeah, so it can be very light. I think uh, you know you need uh, the consensus. Um, so the nodes can be very light. They just need to communicate and agree on on the value and check the certificates. The and finality the is instant. Fast. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's you, don't need, you don't need to do computation. You know, there are lots of there is a lot of complexity added yeah. to blockchain because of the computational layer and they are all intermingled. Finality available to dilemma, right? It's just like yeah. it's always like you need to have like something has done where it is in the partition, then it is there. Yeah, there you but, go. What, but one problem with ZK, but this is the way it is implemented mm -hmm. these days. So first of all, I think we have very early. Yeah. <laughs> um, We've been here in this for a long time. Very early. early. We're still saying early. But very early, especially with ZK, very early, right? So it's it's done in a very ad hoc manner. Right? So what people do, they take a certain program mm -hmm. and then they write a circuit for it. Okay. And more often than not, they just claim that the circuit implements this program. Right? So for example, the program may be written in Python and may implement some machine learning something, right? And then they implement a circuit, having the program more like the algorithm in mind when they design this. They don't take into account the semantics of programming language or anything like that. That's way too low level. Mm -hmm. And then they come up with a circuit and they say, hey, this circuit implements this. And that becomes part of the trust base. Now, everybody who uses this, so this circuit now will sign things. Right. We'll say, hey, this program actually, you know, did this. Everybody now has to trust the circuit. that this circuit is a quality implementation of this program. 
And more often than not, that program doesn't, programming language in which the program was written doesn't even have a formal semantics. You don't even know what that programming language is. And take a program in something we don't know exactly what it is, implementing something that we believe we know what it is, <laughs> and then write a circuit for that thing that we believe we know what it is, but we look at the program, we look at the circuit, a big gap. It's like a blind man telling the how the elephant is. <laughs> and that's how ZKEVM is actually. Yeah. Also, they did this, they implemented this circuit, which is super complex. I mean, the polygon ZKVM, super complex. And then just a claim out of the blue that, hey, this circuit, which is super complex, all these 10 guys spent like two years working on it, you know, very, very smart guys. I agree with that, actually. I'm not trying to belittle them. They are very smart guys. I think the approach can be improved, though. Right? So now they implemented the whole EVM as a circuit. That's a huge achievement. Right? Yeah. But it's a very difficult thing to do, and, 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 and a lot to trust. Everybody now has to trust that that is the correct implementation. Not to mention that two weeks from now, the EVM on the you know, Ethereum will go to the next version and who updates the circuit. <laughs> right, so the circuit will there will be a, a gap. Auditing a, auditing a circuit is an art, uh, an auditor told me. It's not my word. Like it's, it's not a science, that it's an art. Why? Because nobody knows how to do it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so, that's actually... But so, let me tell you how I think it should be done. Right. Okay? So, we should still have a circuit, uh -huh. but only one circuit. I know it sounds strange. Only one circuit for only one program. Okay. You that's... know what program? I'm talking yeah. about the proof checker. You want the proof checker ah. here. The mathematical proof checker. Right. Right. And now, I separate concerns. I execute the program with the semantics, and I observe it, right, all the steps, mathematical proof, and I check it with this proof checker, <coughs> and I check that everything is all right in the computation. And now, with the SNART version, the circuit corresponding to the proof checker, now I generate a cryptographic proof. I achieve the same result as with the circuit corresponding to the VM itself. Right. Without doing that. So instead of, instead of implementing a circuit for, I don't know, how many hundreds, thousands of lines of code, uh, you know, we have in the EVM, right? So instead of implementing a circuit for that complicated, big program, the EVM interpreter, so that we implement a circuit only for this proof checker, which has, you know how big the proof checker is? No. 240 lines of code. 240 lines of code. That's, that's it. That's it. Yep. <laughs> It has, has, it, it's a case statement, it's a loop with a case state, taking each step, a case statement with 15 cases. Each case is a proof rule, like modus ponens that we discussed before. Right? Check modus ponens. Check, you know. So it's already check. succinct in a way. It's super succinct. No, no, no the, the, the program is succinct, but the, the, proof, the, is the proof is big. It's, right. it's... But, but, but we want succinct programs to generate circuits for, for two reasons. Right? First of all, because you have high confidence in the correctness of your circuit. Okay? And second, because uh, the circuit will be simpler, right? And faster that way. But we still have to deal with this big input, right? And uh, we have a prototype, we are playing with it. Hopefully, you know, soon we can uh, launch <laughs> a product based on that. Now I have a fun question. Everyone talks about cryptography was going to break with the quantum computing. We don't know the blockchain will work as it is with the quantum computing. Hmm. So, what do you think about the content? I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not that far. Uh, no, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know that. I know that there are, you know, very, you know, prominent researchers uh, looking at, you know, techniques, how to, you know, how to make cryptographic techniques work correctly, even in the presence of quantum computing. Uh, but I'm not one of those. <laughs> Well, are we going to see anything in in the, in, the, in our mainstream life in the next a decade or so? I don't think so. I don't think we'll see anything coming from quantum computing that fast. But I know that that uh, I I think Algorand, right? They they have a version of the algorithm where they prove that their algorithm is uh, is uh, safe with respect to quantum computing. Oh, we can't. Uh, the, the, the proofs they are doing is not breakable with the quantum proofs. Something like that. Something. Yeah. yeah. Quantum yeah. proofs. But I don't know. I don't, I don't know that. That's not my field. Mm. Yeah, I don't know about quantum proofs. So, back to runtime. How big is the team now? 
60 people. You know, 60 people. There are many of us logicians, mathematicians, uh, PhDs. <laughs> Yeah. And is it spread across everywhere? As how is this? All over the world, yes. Um, and then in terms of uh, you know, projects and teams, so we have auditors, mm -hmm. then we have uh, infrastructure developers, product developers, and tool developers, right? So uh, we use our own tools, like the K-Framework, right, to do audits. Um, and, and one thing that I'm very proud, actually, in the team is that we found the balance Right, how people can move around in the company, depending on what they want to do. Yeah. And we find that many people want to start with, when we hire them, start as auditors, because this way they learn the craft, <laughs> right? they learn what they need to do, and they use the tools at the same time. Right? And then this way they discover limitations in the tools, or limitations in the specification language, or limitations in K itself. And then they say, hmm, I'd like to work on that, actually, right? And then when they are done with this audit, or maybe another one, if they want to, then they can move to a different team. The teams are virtual, right? To a different team, and they work on this product, or this specification language, or this, you know, fix this, or implement some automation in the K-Framework, right? And then uh, when they are done with it, they may take like four, five, six months. Now when they are done with it, they go back to auditors, now use their own tool. Okay, and they feel really good about it, and then they want everybody to use their tool, right? And, uh, and then they will go and teach the others how to use the tool. So basically, we have a very wide range of expertise in the, in the company. Whenever you get stuck, you have a question, you go and ask somebody, somebody will immediately, you know, help you with respect to the code base, which is huge, as I told you, but also with foundations. If you want to understand, hey, I think, how can I generate a proof, you know, for this particular thing? <laughs> Well, no, you should do it the other way around. <laughs> so there is a huge area of growth for anyone who is entering into runtime. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, definitely. And also all these tools, you know, everything we do, it may look like different things, you know, a bit of monitoring, a bit of specification of a programming language, um, you know, like, I don't know, pick a language for a blockchain, like we, we did with Bluetooth, for example, for Cardano, you know, and then EVM on the other hand, and auditing, and um, symbolic model checkers and deductive verifiers and the ZK stuff. It may look like lots, all these things are different and say that we cover all the space, we do all things all over the place. But in fact, all of them converge to the same vision. Right. That in the end, right, we can make claims. We, we develop the infrastructure that will allow a future in which people can make claims. And these claims can be claims of correctness of some code or claims of execution of the program. This program executed, I got 42 so claims. And these claims come with correctness certificates, check marks, which you check and now you know that the claim is true for good. Right? So that can be used in lots of different applications. Right? So that's why we think of what we do in runtime verification more like we develop technology, right? For infrastructure of blockchains of the future and uh, for formal verification and for auditing and yes we also do auditing sometimes we find it a bit unfair when people say that hey not verification the best auditors the best security auditors or um, you know the first ones who use formal verification on the blockchain the first who verify uniswap yes all those things are true but there's so much more <laughs> going on <laughs> it's not just auditing Right. We do auditing because that's there. It also pays the bills, <laughs> right? But uh, that's only to help us actually understand the technology that needs to be developed better. Um, so we, you know, we are coming to wrap, but I just want to touch one more thing. You know, congratulations on the latest um, being to the American Scientific Society. So oh, thank you. Right, thank you. So that's, <laughs> that's great. So do you do you mind to share? Your your experience on that one, and then where, how do you look forward? Um, right. So so this AAAS fellow, um, an IEEE fellow, an ACM fellow. These are awards that uh, um, that you get in your career at certain uh, stages when you have certain achievements. And by the way, I don't have the ACM award yet. I have only the IEEE and the A. Triple S <laughs> that you mentioned, um, and this uh, they are all for the development of runtime verification in the K framework. This um, 
So these awards, you know, have a statement mm -hmm. what the award is for. Right? It's for anti verification, advanced anti verification, and uh, programming language semantics and formal verification. Um, so it, it, it's a time, it's a time uh, award, right? So it's not like you proved a very hard result uh, and uh, because of that, like have us in mathematics or prove on, you know, conjecture that nobody knows how to prove before. Um, it's really a marathon, right? So you do hard work all the time and 30 years later, it comes you are to given you. such an award, you know, then 20 more years later, <laughs> another award. It's good to be there, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They are more like rewards rather than awards. <laughs> this would be called awards. Yeah, rewards. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, for, you so much. for sharing um, all for the For the questions. Stories. Very good question. <laughs> all right. So, Andres, um, that's a good question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank for you. Your talk.